You feel it, you experience it, but you can't see it. It's the dark matter of management that makes your life as a service designer so hard whenever you try to bring design into organizations. In this episode, you'll learn what these dark forces actually are and of course, how you can effectively deal with them. Because when you do, your life will not only get easier, but design will also be able to live up to its promise of making organizations more human-centered. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hello, I'm Marzia. This is a service design show, episode number 129. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are the hidden things that make a difference between success and failure, all to help you make great services happen that have a positive impact on people and business. Our guest in this episode is somebody who lives at the intersection of design, business, and organizational psychology. She's the design director at LiveWork. Her name is Marcia Arico. Let's face it, the reality is that in most organizations, the current way of working is conflicting with design. For you as a service designer, it might be challenging to deliver the impact that you'd like. This begs the question, what is the best way to bring design into organizations that don't have an established design practice yet and sometimes might even be hostile to this new way of working? If you stick around till the end of the episode, you'll learn how you can be of more value to the people around you and just have more fun in your work so you don't get stressed out. If you enjoy conversations like this, know that we bring a new conversation every two weeks. So if you haven't done so already, click that subscribe button and that bell icon to be notified when a new conversation comes out. That's all for the intro. And now let's jump into the conversation with Marcia. Welcome to the show, Marcia. Ciao, Mark. Good to see you again. The last time we met was in... Budapest. It was a long time ago, unfortunately. It was face at the Doers face. Conference. Yeah, uh, it was legendary like conference. 500 people. Yes, yeah. so many people in a room <laughs> yeah you were on stage i was on stage there and uh, we didn't get a chance to uh, talk a lot after that but i definitely remembered your presentation and i thought well i need to get her on the show one day and, and now we're here for the people who don't know who you are could you give a short introduction sure um so my name is marcia i'm design director of LibWork studio i've been in LibWork for eight years Seems quite a very long time. And I'm a bit of a hybrid. I'm a designer, but with a PhD in organizational studies. So I've always been interested in the combo between design and business. So this is what I do. Yeah. And uh, you're an Italian living in the Netherlands right now. I am. <laughs> Sicilian cool. living in the Netherlands. Sicilian. Oh, yeah. Sorry. We need to be more specific about that. Um, Marcia, um to get to know you a little bit better, I've got five questions for you that you need to answer as quickly as possible. A rapid fire question round. Don't overthink them. Just answer uh, with the first thing that comes to your mind. So, uh, okay. ready? Yes. All right. What's always in your fridge? Zucchini. Okay. Uh, which book or books are you reading at the moment? Reinventing Organizations. Lalu. Mm, I will add a link to that down below. Um, which superpower would you like to have? Uh, flying, for sure. Mm, well, a lot of people. And uh, what did you want to become when you were a kid? An architect, An like architect. my father. Mm. Okay. And uh, now a question that I'm really uh, curious also about is, what was the first time you learned about service design? Uh, during my master's degree. Well, actually, at the end of my BA, I did a BA in product design. And my final dissertation was on designing the rituals of death. And so the committee was expecting me to create a product while, without even knowing it, I designed a service. And they didn't like that. They were like, what is the product? And I was like, you guys, this is way more than a product. It's a service. And they were like, no, this is not a thing. And then I looked around for a master's degree that could help me understand the service side. I discovered that there was a whole thing around service design. And that was my 
Eureka moment. Hmm. Hmm. Cool. Uh, is that is, is some of your work uh, related to uh, that educational part still online somewhere? I don't think so. It was in Italian. I did mm. my BA in Italian, but I could dig okay. it. Okay. And uh, you also did a PhD in which topic was it? It was the adoption of service design in organizations. Okay. And I decided to do it um, in a business school because I felt that I wanted to understand better that side of the story. I, uh, and again, yeah. it was incredibly hard. Like there was no business school that were, was willing to give me an opportunity to do a PhD there because they were like, you have a design background, go to a design school. What do you want here? I was like, yeah, I, I think, you know, there is something that we can share and learn from each other. They were like, no, just go do an MBA and then if you want, come back. And I was like, no. So it took so me happened. like three yeah. years. It took me three years. And at the end, I found, you know, Professor at Copenhagen Business School that was enlightening and it was... You know, seeing the power in the combination was really interested in uh, exploring the space, and then and then it gave me a chance. Hmm. Awesome! I I love the topic in the intersection of business and design. Uh, we mm. talk a lot about it on the show, and I think it's super important. Marcia, what is the topic you want to talk about today? What do we want to share with the community? Mm. Well, I was thinking to talk about a topic that. I haven't cracked yet, so this could be an opportunity to have a conversation with you and try and find, you know, I guess it would be an opportunity to shed some light on some key questions and then see what others people think. And the topic is the, the one of dark matter. Um, it's a notion that um, comes from Dan Hill. He wrote a book some time ago, an excellent book. I absolutely recommend it, um, called Dark Matter and Trojan Horses. And it basically talks about this <clears throat> invisible, intangible fluid that makes the culture, the structures, and the policies of an organization that makes it incredibly difficult for change to happen, and especially for design to operate in an organization. And I find it incredibly fascinating in the way it talks about it. And very recently, I, it clicked in my mind that actually what he's talking about is very much what I've been researching in my PhD, but I was just calling it differently. You know, I was using institutional theory in my PhD. I was talking about organizational logics. But fundamentally, it's the same story. And what um, I discovered in my PhD is that, you know, uh, organizations operate through a set of logics. And those logics are, you know, fundamentally made by practices, things that are actually visible, as well as principles and beliefs that, that are not. And, the, and people walk carrying these logics, uh, and they fundamentally define what is legitimate to do in an organization or not. It legitimizes action. And so it's very hard, to, they are very hard to trace, to be honest, because there, there is not one place to go look for, for an organizational logic, as there is not one place to go look for a dark matter, it's just everywhere. It's everywhere in the way people talk, it's everywhere in the, play, in the way people make decisions, in the way they assign budgets, it's just everywhere. Um, so I went through a process of actually trying to dig how to recognize a logic and how you define it, and in what way that hinders, if you like, uh, the introduction of design um, in any given organization. Yeah, yeah. So if I uh, may interrupt you for a second, I think uh, I definitely experienced this dark matter. Like you said, it's often very hard to grasp and very hard to point at, but you experience it. Like you experience the resistance, you experience the language, you experience sort of the symptoms of what you call the dark matter and uh, often uh, because design is something different than the existing organizational logic that that sort of the resistance becomes even more experienced right yeah for sure but the interesting thing for me is that in the moment in which you start really defining the blocks and the elements that make a given logic and so you start breaking it down, it's way easier to start understanding what are the points at which there is fundamental conflicts that is going to be very difficult to resolve. And what are the points that actually there might be some opening, there would be like an opportunity to plug in. Mm. 
For example, one of the logics that I recognized in some of the organizations that I researched is the digital one. It's the digital first kind of logic. And uh, that comes with a concept of speed, comes with agile as main process, right? And although for many aspects, uh, design is in conflict with some of these principles, uh, something like agile and the belief of iterative is fundamentally complementary. So once you start breaking any given logic in pieces, you can start finding what are the plugins, what are, what are the spaces that I can actually use to create a, a meaningful connection, rather than spending a lot of time trying to change something that is fundamentally incompatible and it's not gonna it's not gonna work out. It's just energy draining, right? Yeah, yeah. So. Th- maybe also that's sort of the underlying theme is like how do we bring design into organizations that don't have a strong design heritage Mm -mm. so you know design usually it's a i I like to you know talk about design as a medium to achieve a goal right so you don't bring design for design's sake nobody does you bring design because you're trying to achieve something and so what what i usually say is that design walks on the legs of some other logics. And sometimes, you know, the logic is the customer logic. You know, you want to become more customer centric. You have a, um, you know, renewed belief in the power of putting the customer at the center of everything you do. And you recognize design as a way to do that. Or you want to become a more sustainable organization, for example. And you discover, believe that design can be a medium for that. It's not the only medium. You can do it in very different ways, but you just choose the design is the way that you want to explore to do that, right? And so the reason why design enters into an organization is already a very important thing to understand because nobody invests in design for design's sake. It's just not a thing. I hope not, yeah. <laughs> right. And so that, that understanding <clears throat> is fundamental to create the right narrative. I recently, in the last, I don't know, four or five years, just stopped to talk about design with people in organizations during large, you know, customer-centric transformations, for example. This is not what they're interested in, right? This is not the reason why I'm there. Sure, you know, I can talk about design. I can talk about a million other things. They, they heard about Lean. They heard about Agile. Now there's somebody talking about service design. Design thinking It's another thing. Um, it's not necessarily useful at that stage when you're entering in an organization trying to evangelize and trying to, you know, convince people that your way is a better way. Because, you know, who says that your way is a better way? Your way is a way, right? And so what... I started to try and really do is to really empathize with the people that are inside the organizational machine. And, you know, as designers, they're usually very good at empathizing with the customer, the consumer, and the user, the people that are outside of the organization. But I believe it's really important to spend at least the same energy, if not more, to really understanding what are these people trying to do? What is the reason why they behave the way they behave? You know, what, what, what at the end of the day are you, you know, not just measured on, on at the end of the year, but really personally, what are you trying to achieve in this organization? And what is the narrative that you're carrying, right? And once you understand that, then it's very easy to translate whatever it is that you're trying to do with design in words that they can understand and appreciate. And that is a job that takes a lot of passion and time. And sometimes it's incredibly energy draining, but it's incredibly valuable, right? And so, for example, in one of the, you know, big banks that I've been working with lately, uh, we had four or five different narratives of why design was there and what we were even trying to do. So for the people that were, you know, in the technology department, they had this very big problem of proving, I'm talking here about the senior leaders there, they had this very big problem of proving what, what is the return of investment of our X billion technology spend that we have every year. They are no clue, right? And so my story there is to use structures to enable the view to happen, to give you a way to actually start tracking what is the return on investment uh, of your technology spend. And you can do that by design, right? And I don't have to explain you what is the design process to get there. I'm just telling you that these are the things and I'm going to show you the artifacts that might help you reach that goal, right? The story for a char was a completely different one. We were still doing the same program of work, but they were going to experience very different type of value from the program work. Therefore, the, the story had to be different. And at that point, when you touch the fundamental, you know, uh, motivations of people and needs of people, that, then everything starts becoming easier. It doesn't become easy, but it's easier. Sure. Yeah. 
Um, I'm wondering, and you uh, already uh, gave a hint uh, about empathizing with the people we work with uh, next to the people we sort of design for. But how do you get to these narratives? So uh, if we uh, put the narrative of design as the holy grail to solve all the business challenges for uh, at a side for a second, how do we create those other narratives? What did you do in practice actually to come up with a senior leader narrative with an HR narrative? Mm. Well, a few things. First, what I want to mention is that it's not, just, it's not just empathizing with the people, it's also empathizing with the things and the organizational structures, right? It's fundamentally understanding why certain things are done this way, which is not um, necessarily because, you know, people like it, because, you know, most of the people might even hate it, but there is a reason why the machine is organized that way. And so empathizing also with that machine, even if you fundamentally dislike it, you know, because some of these places are fundamentally dehumanizing workers and employees and um, having an empathy to fundamentally understand that side of the story is, is also super important. Um, having said that, there, were, there are a few things that any virtually any service organization in, in, on this planet is uh, simply lacking and is at the basis of some of the fundamental problems that some of these organizations have. And one of these big um, issues that I've been you know, recognizing from one place to the, to the other, at least in the organizations that I've been seeing and working with, is that there is very rarely an understanding of what, is the, what are the services that we are delivering to our customers. And in what way are these services coming together? If you ask virtually to any person in the organization, they would be able to tell you. They will tell you, they will tell you like a slice of it, right? They will tell you like a, you know, a few that they know because they're connected to their role. But there is very rarely a one view of all the services that the organization delivers. And, and on top of that, there is very rarely an understanding of what is the kind of value that that service brings to our own organization. Very few organizations really measure things like that. Therefore, it's very hard to decide where to put your money, right? So usually what happens is that, you know, when you see, you know, budget allocated to one thing or another, you ask, you know, how, how come you got to the point that you have this money to do this thing, random thing, whatever thing it is. And usually it's because, you know, a senior leader woke up, started to notice something and then called, they started screaming. And the person who screamed the most and has most power, then, you know, budgets all of a sudden get allocated somewhere. But there is no real understanding on, you know, is that actually a priority for us against what? And in what way are you evaluating that? Because there is no one view. So it's incredibly hard to actually decide whether, you know, this budget allocated here makes more sense than over there. And so this is usually one of the first things that we try to tackle in, in, pro, in programs of this kind, in customer-centric programs. And, and, and one, once you know that that is the problem, you cannot just go and explain the thing like that because they will go like, yeah, do we, what is that? What are you talking about? Like, so we basically tend to, knowing that that's the thing that we would like to do as an artifact to bring to, that could unlock a whole number of different issues, we're trying to connect that to whatever it is that the people are trying to achieve. And so that usually when I start a custom transformation program, I spend a few months just talking around with people, you know, having coffees, talking to the people that have been there for a long time, people that have been there for little time, people that have been moving around and trying to understand how things are done here. Um, and so that already gives you quite a flavor. And it's not just me, of course, it's the entire team. And, and that already, and, and we always ask, you know, who do you think I should speak next? What is the person? And there is always, oh my God, you should speak with Frank that has been here for 25 years and, you know, he knows this and that. And um, yeah, and then you start basically creating a picture of what, what are the routines, what are the dynamics, what are the, you know, the, the policies that are driving certain behavior, what are the, the, the people, principles and, and values that really drive certain ways of doing things. And so you connect that with the thing that you know is not working, with individual motivations of people that you know have the money to unlock certain pieces of the work, and you circle it, right? And you try to make all of that work. Awesome. So I can imagine that uh, it's great when you have the opportunity to... Um, somebody's, uh, I think, called it like uh, being a historian, like 
understanding the history of the company, digging in an archaeologist, digging up stuff, uh, trying to create... Organizational ethnography. <laughs> awesome. Even better. Um, how do you... Um, what kind of client does it take uh, to give you the space and opportunity to spend this time actually charting this first rather than immediately mm -hmm. going into solution mode? What kind of client okay. organization? I don't think there is one type. I can tell you the types that I've been working with and sure. we can see together whether we find a pattern. Um, so in the case of the bank... Um, they have no burning platform. They have a gazillion money. Like, they don't care, honestly. There, there is no real um, need emerging from, you know, the market. There is no real need emerging from internally. Um, I think that the real key was um, I individuals inside the organization, in specific uh, line of businesses. They were dealing with some sort of design, in a way or another, more UX, they really sense the need for a more strategic view of design, um, for, for, for an orchestration among the different design disciplines, as well as a better plug-in between design and the rest of the organization. So they learned about service design and they decided to establish a service design practice. And so they came to us um, saying, we need to establish a service design practice. And I said, okay, there is quite a lot of dark matter to deal with here, because this is a 250,000 people organization in I don't know even how many different countries. And so they accepted that, you know, we both, from both sides, really need to understand what is the playground here and what is the thing that makes sense to do. Because fundamentally, you know, you can, you know, historically the way, you know, a lot of these places work is that, you know, you, you decide that that is your goal, is the thing that you want to achieve, and then you create a roadmap that is locked for three years and then off you go. And those stuff just very usually don't, don't work, you know. In a few months, the thing is already updated. And so we were very honest at the very beginning saying, you know, here there is a kind of a broad direction that we think we should, you know, um, consider. And, you know, these, these are some lines that we should follow. But there are a million unknowns and there are so many dependencies and we need to understand all these different things and how they come together and, and we need some space to play if you want to do this right. Otherwise, you can do it as, you know, a lot of other organizations that just hire 10 people and just throw them there and see what happens. And they hate themselves and the organization and everybody else and they probably, after a while, either quit or change job. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So I think that was the bank. Then on another side with um, retailer sports um, brand that we worked with, um, we were inside digital omnichannel. It was a very digitally driven, um, um, yeah, of course, um, unit. And they started a quite big agile transformation, but very quickly they realized that, you know, agile, just it's just a way to make certain processes faster, probably even more iterative. But if at the core, but it's very much looking at, at um, humans at a user level. There is very uh, little you know, input from a customer or a consumer level. And so therefore what you end up doing is kind of, excuse the French, the same crap, but way faster. Uh, that you know, at a meaning level for a customer it doesn't really change. It's just better at usability probably, or looks better, right? So it wasn't really moving the, what the uh, unit and the organization was trying to achieve, and they recognized design as a way to bring that layer, strategic layer. So again, it was an individual. So I guess it's individuals. Hmm. And what, what's, okay, uh, but what is the tr uh, threat or the characteristic or of these individuals? Because what you're uh, prescribing, and I also strongly believe in, is that you first want to slow, quote unquote, slow down, know what you're dealing with like you said understand the understand the playground uh. before you actually move forward in the right direction and that slowing down it goes against most uh organizational logics that i know so it oh, takes yeah, yeah. a specific type of person yeah you know good observation and uh, you you don't slow down you move you move at multiple speeds so what usually happens is that 
you start a proof project that goes super fast. You know, it's a 16 weeks thing that, you know, b- b- opens up like a big problem that everybody's had. There is a low hanging fruit that everybody recognized that it was a problem that needs to be fixed. You do it fast, you do it well, you do better research, you throw a whole bunch of very skilled designers to actually show the value of it. And people go, oh, wow, that's useful. And then at the same time, you have a second speed, which is the organizational ethnography. They're trying to understand. You have another team of people. Some of the people will be the same, really trying to understand how you're doing things. You, know, you might use some of these projects to do that or not, you know, because you might want to end up in different pockets of the organization. And so you try and move at multiple speeds so that you can feed the monster that needs speed and needs results and needs things and value for money. And so you feed the monster now with things that, undoubtedly are useful it's just not the key you know because when you do um you know usually some of these proof projects are service improvement projects and you know it's not going to cut it sure you can improve that service then good luck implementing it because we know what are the difficulties then to take the thing and make it happen because of the dark matter story because the organization is not set up to work their way but at least they, they you know they can see what's the value of it they can see something emerging tangible and then you have another speed going on. And you might have multiple of those, you know. You might have one speed with the design team, but you have, might have another one with a group of senior leaders, and you try and orchestrate that work in, in that way. That makes sense. And uh, using those uh, projects as a way to actually, uh, it's the prototyping is not a word, but maybe probing the organization, yeah. like uh, feeling where the resistance is by doing stuff rather than talking about stuff um, yeah. and then uh, sort of having a second track or maybe a third track where you uh, uh, collect that dark matter and make it tangible, make it uh, into an object you can discuss. I'm also curious, like, how do you um, define progress in this process? So <laughs> progress is really easy when you have that uh service improvement thing that you're working towards right mm-hmm. everybody sees that everybody feels that everybody sees the the workshops the outcomes but what is how do, how do you find progress on that other level it's when people start talking about other things and that might take a week sometimes it takes two years do you um, have an example yeah so there was a moment where we managed after about six months in uh, to create this uh, level zero service architecture that I was mentioning before, right? This one view of all the services coming together. And we named these services because they were not named. So we named these services in a quite customer centric way, like from a customer perspective, what the service was doing for them. And we shared this view with a whole bunch of senior leaders. And you could really see some of the faces going like, oh, like really clicking. And then for that moment on, people were referring to services that the organization was delivering with that label that we, you know, define collectively as a team with all the other stakeholders as a thing. Like that became the service and they were talking about it in a very customer centric way. And there was no even, you know, question anymore. It just became a thing all of a sudden, right? And so, the, the language started to change because of that labeling that was very customer centric. They were using very customer centric words and those things stick, right? Then it becomes part of the way you talk and the way you relate to things and the way you start thinking about stuff. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you because my key question here is this is great. And when language uh, starts to shift, uh, the whole organization starts to shift. But what do you feel made? made it that this message did stick and so many others didn't. What was it in this specific message? I think it was a very simple one. Uh, like it was one image, very little words, few words. There was no big presentation, there was no big, there was no big deck, there was no big posters, no a million sticky notes. It was just a thing that was, that was honest. It was not particularly pretty, but it was honest. And it was fundamentally touching um, a, a pain point that they had that they couldn't even reckon, you know, word it, you know, because mm-hmm. no, no organization really operates this way. Very few do, and it's not a common thing. So, so I think that is what they were just ready for it, and they saw how that connected to their reality, and they um, 
yeah, and there was no fluff around it. I guess that's the thing. Nobody was trying to convince them about anything. It was just, you know, an honest conversation about we think this is useful. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And of course, for some people, it didn't work at all. They just left the meeting and never showed up again. Fine, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Now, well, regarding that, I can... Uh, um, with these things, I think we as service designers are often able to spot these uh, invisible forces and, and maybe not in a very structured way, but and name them and uh, articulate them. Changing them is already harder, but... Uh, when we leave, like, how how do we make it sustainable? What did like language is a, is an important part, right? If the language is there, if it's adopted by the organization, then even when you leave as an outside consultant, that language will stay there. But have you found other ways to make this into something that's really part of the organization rather than something external? And you here you're talking about. Um, that change, whatever that is, or, or design? Well, yeah. what I'm talking about here is you want to create an environment or lo logics, how, uh, like you name them, that uh, are more compatible with a design approach, with a design mindset, uh, in order to make sure that design is able to deliver on its promise. How do you make sure that those things stay around? And how do you embed them? I think it's the other way around. Like, you know, okay. it has to be designed to adapt to whatever thing is happening here, you know, because nobody's gonna, you know, an organization that has been working like that for 150 years, whatever, they're not gonna adapt to design so the design can flourish. Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess the key here is to adapt design so that it's useful. And, you know, and, you know, the one thing that I keep telling to my team all the time is that good enough is enough. It's got to work. And so it doesn't matter if it's right within your construct of design. You know, it's got to work within this context. And and it might be that, you know, this is not the thing that you would do in an ideal world, but within this context works, and that's great. And it's just do that. And you try till it works for the people around you within the context they are in, you know? Uh, it's a very different story than if you're trying to fundamentally shift the very core, the very purpose of an organization, right? At that point, the approach must be different. But if you're trying to improve the way, for example, the level, the maturity of uh, customer centricity of an organization, that has to be the path. Design has to adapt within the context within which it operates. Yeah. yeah. So um, we've used this word on the show more often, but uh, we have to have maybe have a more pragmatic approach to design rather mm -hmm. than a, a, a theorist or purist approach uh, to design, like whatever it takes, whatever yeah. helps us to get to the outcome that we're aiming for. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, <laughs> well done. <laughs> uh, did, you, um, did you identify other uh, moments where things clicked so one moment like you mentioned was when they saw the overview when you gave them the maybe the not so pretty visual and the language no. things changed were there other moments where you realized okay now from <laughs> this moment on things are different um at the very beginning of a few of these programs actually this is a recurring thing <clears throat> i usually show up and say we need to think about the operating model for design. How is design going to work within this organization? But most of all, how design is going to work with other disciplines? What are the handover moments and the plugins? And we need to design those because otherwise it's going to implode in our own hands. It's not going to work out, a scale at least. You know, it can work within a, a limited uh, number of people and limited scope. But when you start scaling, then, then it just doesn't work. And usually the answer is like, no, we do have an operating model. We don't need to think about that. And usually my answer is that, okay, and we're going to see you in six months. <laughs> and then usually what happens is that just teams become incredibly dysfunctional. Designers become incredibly unhappy because there is no cl clarity of what is their remit. Because there is no operating model. There is no clarity on their remit. There is no clarity on how are they going to work with other people. There is no clarity on where, where design ends, where technology starts. Um, 
who is the product owner? When you start talking about services, who is the service owner? Virtually no organization has a role of a service owner. And in a service, you will have four or five different products. Who orchestrates that? So questions of this kind, the whole part of, you know, a design operating model and very rarely that stackled at the right time till, you know, things start breaking. Yeah, and then things people start, start to break leaving. down. Yeah. And that's the moment when concept of this kind click, right? Yeah. Because you see it in practice how fundamentally the machine does not work. You just cannot mm. scale. You just start breaking at the edges. And 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 so that was another moment where where things started to click. And you know, you gotta experience it. Sometimes it's just fine. You know you, you know, I know it because I've seen it, but sometimes you, you have to let it go, make it happen, experience how the thing breaks. It's not the end of the world. And then you start feeling on your own skin what is the need yeah. for that specific operating model and how it should look like. Because again, there is no one recipe. It's not that you know there is one operating model for design that you know you can just copy paste everywhere. This is so uh, recognizable. I have been in so many projects in my early service design days where we just could tell at the start of the project we know what's going to happen in six months. We've been through many projects. We know these are the challenges that we're going run to run into. It's smart to address them now. Uh, and usually the answer was, we'll see when we get there or we'll fix that later. And then like just like you described, you, six months later, you're exactly at the point. But it's, it's almost impossible to get people to worry about those things early on. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious how this um, topic relates to what you just previously said, like nobody cares about design. So having that conversation early on uh, about operating models and where the handover is, like nobody cares. Right? And they don't see the part, they didn't see the relevance of it now. Exactly. Care. So mm -hmm. why, why I, I I have an answer, but I'm curious what you would say. So why have this conversation at the start anyway? Because, you know, when you let the six months pass, the six months that I mentioned, the six months that you mentioned, um, that has a human price. You know, in those six months, a few people might burn out, leave. The design leader might completely lose confidence in his own self, right? Because things start breaking and it's very hard to handle. And it's very hard for me to see over and over again, these amazing design leaders in some of these organizations really paying a personal price but for themselves and with their own team. Um, so I think it is important to mention it, and it is important to flag it, and I will never stop doing that. Um, and, you know, eventually I'm hoping that somebody will say, well, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Let's start thinking about it. <laughs> well, I, I think it adds to your credibility. So you don't want to be at the end of six months saying, yeah, I told you. But uh, the next time you sort of come up with uh, an advice or an argument, maybe people are more likely to, to take you up on it. So I think it's smart to say that these are probably the things you're going to run into. But uh, hey, you know, yeah. next time. Uh, with regards to scaling design, scaling service design, uh, the operating models, I think a lot of us would already be happy to be in this luxury position where we, where, where the challenge is to scale. Like first, most of us, I think, are in the challenge of actually getting it done. But let's say we're at the stage that we are, uh, we can scale it. What is it that we actually want to scale? It uh, depends what as an organization you want to do. Okay. <laughs> I don't think, well, I mean, in again, your I mean, example answer, of the sports brand, yeah. My answer will always be contextual, right? Um, in the case of the sports brand, um, I think what they're trying to scale is uh, design capability. So, you know, there are very few service designers, very few in house at a strategic level. Uh, product teams find it incredibly useful to work with service designers because, you know, they give them a, you know, for the whole reasons that we know, an end-to-end -end perspective of what is that the actual product, uh, what how to prioritize investment within you know their product, how to inform the agile teams and in the backlog, how to make decisions right for them as as managers is, is incredibly useful. But there is a bottleneck. You know, when you start seeing um, value into these things, and you are you you then will reach a point from push to pull, right, where you have designers trying to convince some, a few product owners around the organization, at least 
in the case of this sports brand, that you know design could help you with some of the issues that you have to the point where there are 15 product owners behind the door saying, hey, I heard that uh, you do service design, can we do some too? But then you have five designers. And so how do you make this work? And so I guess that it has to be critical mass. I mean, I guess he has to be, you know, the work with every single individual to see the value for you. Again, at the beginning, you know, of what I was saying at the beginning of this conversation, showing the value to you, create something that is useful for you, that makes a change in the way you do things. And then, you know, you do it again and again and again till you will find in a position where you don't have to do that anymore because people are just coming to you, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you, you sort of demonstrated that value on a, a local scale and then you can yeah. start to expand it. Now, based on what you've seen, like what are the two or three most important things that need to be in place in order to, in, in the operating model, in order to uh, uh, foster and accelerate and, and, and fuel this further adoption? Um, multiple sponsors. Because, you know, it's um, already difficult to find one, but usually it's not enough. So the people that actually are in the position to unlock budgets, to unlock money, to tell to people, okay, take 20% of your time and try this thing, uh, you need a few of those. Because, uh, you know, interests change, people change jobs, and this stuff takes years. I mean, an organization, on a transformation of this kind that I'm describing here with the sports brand or the the bank, these are transformations that take seven to 10 years, no question there. So you can't put all your <laughs> eggs into one basket, let's say. Into one sponsor, so adding, yeah. <laughs> add into one sponsor, forget it. So you, you need multiple sponsors, ideally multiple pockets of the organization so that you have multiple entry points because also one of them will, will fail. So that's for sure one. Um, the second one is a good, solid design team, I think. You know, very often I see organizations going out and just hiring a bunch of junior designers, which, you know, great. They add a lot of value, junior designers, I'm not saying, but it cannot just be that. You, you need people that have experience in actually bringing design in an organizational context and they have the passion to do it, which is another problem that I've seen, you know, in teams and teams, design teams breaking, that they don't necessarily have a passion for it. You know, there are certain people they just want to do the blueprint. They want to do the redesign the customer experience. They want to do that side of the thing, which is great and it's needed, but it's a very different thing. And so I think that the, the bringing the design organization, the politics, the talking, the relationships, like you got to enjoy it. Otherwise, it's going to consume you. And I've seen many teams just breaking because of that. And then, you know, you start dropping balls. You start refusing work. You start not, you know, taking the opportunities that are presented because you don't have that, you know, energy. Yeah, so, and so then, yeah, yeah, just to add to, to what you just said, most likely if you're just a junior designer fresh out of college and you want to apply the tools and methods and uh, just get your hands dirty with that, more experience with that, yeah. you'll probably burn out on all the additional, you, you probably won't even notice all the additional conversations that you need to have in order to yeah. actually be able to do the work that you want to do. So yeah, exactly. you need you need people who who have, like you mentioned before, who have experienced the pain of yeah. delivering stuff which isn't being adopted and then thinking, I, I must start designing at a different level in order to get this work out into the world. Yeah. Yeah, totally true. And the third one? The third one is, um, you know, what we call the change congestion, being aware of that. You know, for sure, somewhere else in this organization, somebody's doing a similar thing or a parallel thing, or an overlapping thing, that they might call the same or something similar. And, uh, and probably there are 35 of those initiatives around. <laughs> and so being aware of the change that is happening in this organization, that the change programs that are happening in this organization, for what reason, how are they called, uh, is super important because all these different programs will try to you know, claim money, attention, stakeholders' time, you cannot do everything at once. So being aware of, uh, you know, change, how change happens here right now, uh, it's a key thing. And who are the people that are doing it, actually? Yeah, 
so and this comes back to again what we discussed earlier that uh, uh organizational ethnography uh mm, yeah that's that's a key part of our work that's a key part yeah. now <clears throat> let's try to bring this down into maybe um uh the reality of a smaller team whether internal or external so let's say you are two three four service designers strong what would your advice be in such a situation how do you even start with uh, uh, handling this dark matter stuff a small team in a large corporate or small team yeah in a small yeah because team. i think that's the reality for most service designers yet we haven't we don't have an established service design practice yet we're still in the early adopters stage where do we start find friends <laughs> so what i mean with that is that you know you, you're small and you have limited leverage and most probably you're piled up with work that is not even relevant for you they're just you know throwing at you whatever they think is you should be doing um so my advice is usually, you know, go around, again, organizational ethnography, find the people that, you know, have a need, the design can solve, that they're open to try, they want to experiment, and make friends with these people. Create critical mass, start making, you know, small changes, small contribution. Be kind, that's the other thing, you know. Be kind, for me, that is a fundamental thing. Be kind to people around you. Don't goes you know i i've solved it i have the answer you know i know it all because most probably these people know way more than you do about the context of that organization be humble and just be a service that's the point i think that the point is being a service of the people that are around you and really trying to support them to you know use design to make the life better and and and, and do it in multiple places do it over time and, and that in itself will create a critical mass and what would you say to people who sort of feel, okay, I'm doing this, I am kind, I am trying to be of service, but it's just going so slowly, or even worse, like I feel that the organization is working against me, like all the other forces are pushing against what I actually wanna try to do. What, what, what would your advice be to those people? Transformations of this kind do not happen bottom up. I mean, in my experience, Transformation of these kinds either have a strong top-down support with a flourishing bottom-up initiatives. Great, you know, that's the best combination. But you cannot have transformation of these kinds just with bottom-up initiatives or so people believing in it from the, you know, uh, lower ends. Because unfortunately, uh, the organizations that we have today in the way they're set up, they're incredible hierarchical, concentrating power, concentrated decision making, and transformation of these kinds fundamentally touch the core of the purpose, the reason why the organization is here and the way things are done at large. Uh, you cannot do it unless you have that kind of support. I mean, I I you I mean I'm being fully honest here. And, you know, I'm reading right now, I was mentioning the uh, Reinventing Organizations book from Malalu, and I'm loving this book because it's really Talking about that, it's talking about, you know, the evolution of organizations, the metaphors that really drive certain, the, the structures of our organizations today, and in what way they completely choke the life out of people. And, um, and you know, within the structure, there is as much as you can do. And then, you know, there are other types of organization that it defines, you know, teal organizations where, you know, you have self-managing teams, where hierarchy doesn't exist, where you know, self-defined roles, you know, those organizations that if you're lucky enough to be in it, then sure, bottom up, which doesn't exist because there is no bottom, um, will flourish and you will see things change for sure. You create critical mass with the peers that fundamentally believe in it. But if you are in a, you know, bank, in a large insurance, a large manufacturing, telcos, utilities are large, you know, that's not those organizations are not teal organizations yeah. uh what it defines orange organizations and that's it you have to play within that game yeah and and i i think you have to be realistic about your expectations and that might be disappointing at sometimes yeah. because as service designers we see how things can be better on which scale they, they can be better and if we don't have the mandate don't have the influence don't have the decision making uh power 
it can be a bit discouraging to to sort of work on the small thing over here while we know that the bigger thing needs to be addressed, but it's out of our control. And you have to be able to put that in perspective and understand your limitations, work within them, or find another job. Exactly. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, anything else that you'd like to mention about this topic that we didn't discuss yet? Some final thoughts? Final thoughts? I think it's a very interesting time for design leaders. And I've been um, actually spending a lot of time doing design therapy for design leaders these days. <laughs> I mean, officially it's called coaching. But what it, what it turns out to be very quickly is really sessions where you know these people just share and vent the frustration, the pain, the difficulty. You know, you really see the energy draining over time. And um, some excellent you know design leaders that i've been meeting um i don't know i think there is something to be said there i'm not sure what yeah, but yeah. it's something that i keep seeing on and on and on and on mm -hmm. um yeah you know what i yeah. tend to do is just listen so i'm there and go like what do you want to talk about today <laughs> just, yeah, you know, yeah, just yeah. the fact of having somebody out mm -hmm. there that knows what you're experiencing that can be a sparing partner usually helps because it's an mm -hmm. outsider if you like so so yeah, I can fully second that and the experience I've had with the campfire for in-house service designers that's been running for over a year. And uh, with the, it's, it's just eight people getting together and sharing stories about, we call them sometimes the dirty secrets of service design, like okay. not the shiny case studies, but really the, the challenges and the difficulties and all the, uh, the trauma you almost have to go through. Like just having a place and knowing that other people deal with the same shit already mm -hmm. helps. Like, yeah. um, so I can, I can absolutely second that. And I think, well, that's maybe my insight from the last year. Don't try to do it alone. Like find mm -hmm. somebody in a different organization, um, different field, maybe who understands what you're going through and who can sort of be your coach, mentor, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, sparing uh, partner, whatever, yeah. Sparing partner, like you don't, don't go into that boxing ring without having somebody in that corner. Like make sure that you have somebody in that corner. That's, uh, yeah, I, I've seen that with the campfire and it, 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 it really helps small things like that. Yeah, absolutely. If people remember one thing from our conversation, Marcel, what do you hope it is? Um, Think about the stuff that you cannot see because those take 90% of the work. And that, uh, that makes it uh, difficult, the things that we can see, but they are there. <laughs> so the dark matter, the, I think the, the point here is that, you know, when, when you start a uh, customer experience, you know, transformation, you know, customer centric transformation, this kind, 90% is the dark matter management. 10% is going to be the design work. You know, 10% is going to be the blueprints, the journeys, the personas, the, the improvement, mm -hmm. the blah, the stuff that we know. 90% of the work is dark matter management, is understanding the system and learning to work with it. And, and the system changes all the time. It's, it's a dynamic thing. It's not that you learn about it once and it's just um, fixed. And Yeah. And... and uh to sort of again add to that like when people ask me how do i become a better service designer which book should i read to become a better service designer i say read any book except about service design because <laughs> if you read about strategy if you be the read about behavioral economics like all mm. those things hit on exactly what you said the other 90 percent like that 10 percent is important like you need to know yeah, that of course it is yeah you're not to move on that but that the change is uh, the, the real change and the real impact, the real difference is made in, the, in that other 90%, which you have to embrace. Mm -mm. Marcia, if people want to continue this conversation with you, what's a good way to reach out? Oh, um, LinkedIn. I'm always on LinkedIn. Cool. Or email marcia at libworkstudio.com. Awesome. Marcia, thanks so much for addressing this topic. I'd love to talk more about dark matter in organization things. Uh, it's a really uh, catchy term. I hope the language will stick 
and then we'll hear <laughs> more about it. Uh, so yeah, thanks again for sharing this Thank with you. the Service Thank Design you. Show community. Thank you for having me here. It was, it was great. What is your biggest takeaway from this conversation about dark matter? Leave a comment down below. And if you've made it all the way here, you're apparently enjoying conversations like this. So why not subscribe to the channel? Click that button over here and be notified when new episodes come out. Thanks a lot for watching and I look forward to see you in the next video.